Good morning. Welcome this morning. Uh, if you're joining us as a guest, we're glad you're here, and uh, we know we can see a few empty spaces in here. There's a number of us that are out on vacation and different things, and including a conference this morning in Kansas. But uh, we're glad you're here, and uh, things are probably going to look a little different. We're hoping to join a live stream video of the service. Uh, in Kansas, so uh, hopefully that will work, and uh, if it doesn't, we're going to do something different. <laughs> in the way of announcements, uh, I haven't been given anything. I'd just call your attention to a couple of the things in the bulletin. Um, the opportunity to give to Karen and Lakshmi for the education expenses of their kids, and also the upcoming golf cart ministry at Hydro Fair. And there are some others there. Are there any other announcements this morning? As we turn our focus to uh, our worship of God this morning, um, I'm going to use a passage from Deuteronomy. Uh, Christy and I used the Our Daily Bread devotion. And yesterday's devotion from Deuteronomy it was a kind of a repeat of uh, what we've been reading in Numbers from our uh, daily Bible reading plan. And I thought that was neat. Uh, it's the story that the author of the uh, devotion used was an interesting story, so I'm gonna share that this morning. Uh, in the passage, Moses is reminding the people of their weak faith and their disobedience, but also showing them how much God loves and cares for them. Deuteronomy 1, 26 through 31. But you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, The Lord hates us, so he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made us lose heart. They say the people are stronger and taller than we are. The cities are large with walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. Then I said to you, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes and in the desert. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries his son. All the way you went until you reached this place. The author of the Daily Bread devotion for yesterday uh, shared this story, and I'm going to just read it from the, from the devotion book. Uh, in 2019, Hurricane Dorian overwhelmed the islands of the Bahamas with intense rain, wind, and flooding, the worst natural disaster in the country's history. As he sheltered at home with his adult son, who has cerebral palsy, Brent knew they needed to leave. Even though Brent is blind, he had to save his son. Tenderly, he placed him over his shoulders and stepped into chin-deep water to carry him to safety. If an earthly father facing a great obstacle is eager to help his son, think of how much more our Heavenly Father is concerned about his children. In the Old Testament, Moses recalled how God carried his people even as they experienced the danger of faltering faith. He reminded the Israelites of how God had delivered them, providing food and water in the desert, fighting against their enemies, and guiding the Israelites with pillars of, pillars of cloud and fire. Meditating on the many ways God acted on their behalf, Moses said, There you saw how the Lord your God carried you, as a father carries his son. The Israelites' journey through the wilderness wasn't easy, and their faith waned at times but it was full of evidence of God's protection and provision. The image of a father carrying a son, tenderly, courageously, and confidently, is a wonderful picture of how God cared for Israel. Even when we face challenges that test our faith, we can remember that God is there carrying us through them. We worship a righteous and holy God. That's been very evident in our readings this uh, past few weeks in the Old Testament. But he is a deeply loving and forgiving God that knows our weaknesses and our struggles and the storms in our lives. And 
because of that great love, he gave us redemption through his son, Jesus. That's a God worth praising. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful that we can be here and, and worship a great God. We thank you that we can gather together and care for each other and build each other up. And Lord, we just pray that as we join together here, that you would be right here amongst us, that the Holy Spirit would guide what we do and what we say. And Lord, that all that we do would bring glory to you. In Jesus' name. Wow. Let's stand as we sing All the Way My Savior Leads Me.
Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Father, we praise and thank you that we can gather together this morning in your name. You are the holy and awesome creator God. and You are worthy of our worship. You alone can hear our prayer and you have the power to do great things. Lord, we want to do your will here on earth in ways that bring your kingdom closer to those around us. So we ask for your forgiveness of our sins and the strength to forgive each other. Lead us into the good things that you would have us do, things that bring glory and honor to you. Lord, I pray for your healing power among us, especially for Warren, Richard and Marilyn, Mim, Harold, Scarlett, Norma, Dorothy, Keith, and any others who are experiencing health concerns. We pray for strength and healing and encouragement and upholding for them. Be with those who are away from us this morning, either on vacation or away on harvest or at conference. Pray that you'd give guidance and protection to them. Lord, I pray for Pastor Jeff and Dana. Thank you for them and pray that uh, you would continue to give them wisdom and strength and bless them as they serve you here among us at Pleasant View. Lord, I lift up the elders and their families to you for guidance through your word, through your spirit. Give wisdom to lead uh, this congregation in ways that take your word beyond these doors and, and glorify you in our community. I pray for those who are serving around the world too, Corey and Brooke, people who do work with Mennonite Disaster Service, Raleigh and Robin, Kieran and Lakshmi, the Global Disciples. Lord, I pray that you would guide them and uh, provide for their needs. Pray that you'd make their ministry powerful and effective in their different areas. Lord, I pray for the, this nation. I pray for forgiveness. Pray for protection and for guidance. We lift up our local and state and national leaders to you. Pray that you'd give them wisdom. Provide them with godly counsel, Lord, and protect them. Lord, we give you praise and thanks for all you're doing, all that you will do. And we ask all these things in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Are we good, Michael? I think we'll join the service. On wow, thank you, Mark. It was a great kind of intro to the text for that we have been looking at this weekend, which is Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. So I'm going to read that, um, and then I'll have a prayer introduce Eric and have a prayer. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. And there were flies flying around. And the whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. And Isaiah said, Woe is me! I'm, a, I'm ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. 
Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, and with that he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here I am, send me. Our, you have heard the theme for our conference weekend, formed to be sent, and to maybe stretch that a little bit, formed by Christ to be sent like Christ for the sake of others is really the longer version of it. And so uh, looking forward to what Eric has to share. The first input for Friday evening, come on up, Eric. Uh, first, the first input on Friday was uh, about formed, and then yesterday it was about being sent. And um, we have no idea what you're going to say. Uh, I want to say just a couple things about Eric that I think might be important for you to know. Um, Eric uh, uh, is a guy that likes to push himself beyond limits sometimes. Uh, many of you probably don't know that uh, he has done some, uh, he did some arm wrestling at the state fair and did fairly well. Uh, so we won't do that up here. Um, and uh, at one of his birthdays, he wanted to do something really off the rail and hard and tough, push himself. And so he starts at midnight at the Elk River Trail and down in Independence, Kansas. And I won't go into the story. He'll have to tell you how that all went. And I think this, this summer yet, I, I heard there's a few guys that are planning to hike a 14er yeah, a couple weeks. in a couple weeks. And so loves to push himself. And I would say that physically and spiritually. And that's what I want to end at. Um, Eric has the role at Journey of being teaching pastor there as one of the leaders. And uh, God has given him a gift of teaching. And so, Eric, we look forward to what you have to share with us. Eric has a uh, wife, Carmen, and three kids. And so I'm going to pray for you. God, thank you uh, for Eric's openness and his willingness to share this morning. I ask for your Holy Spirit to anoint him. I ask for your Holy Spirit to be where each of us are setting. May our hearts be open to hear what you would want us hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, Howard. Team together at tried to get us to solve our disagreements by arm wrestling, but he never took me up on that. And uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction. I like to push myself, but the the sound text is there a problem with the? I can stick with this if there's a. They came to me right before the right before I got up and said uh, the batteries are drained. I'm like, Howard says I like to push myself. Others would say I'm draining. So I think we are experiencing that uh, technology-wise. But it is an honor to be here with you today. We live in Hutchinson, Kansas, not far down the road. And I have the, um, the privilege of being a part of the team at Journey Men and Light Church, the teaching pastor, my wife Carmen, uh, and I, we have very fond memories of being here in Heston. We moved from Northeastern Ohio to Heston, Kansas in 2005, and we both attended Heston College. Um, I was in the pastoral ministry program, my wife in the nursing program. And this was a very formative, as we're talking about formation, uh, those two years were very, very formative for us. And so, um, grateful uh, for that. Now we have three uh, children. Our oldest will be 13 in a couple of weeks. And uh, our, our middle daughter will be 11. And our, our son, our youngest, is turning nine here soon. So we are, uh, they, they would have loved to be here this morning, but uh, my wife is actually leading, leading worship at uh, Journey at South Hutch this morning. Uh, I'm grateful to have this opportunity to continue to just explore this theme that we've been in the last few days. And I realize not all of us were part of the conference gatherings, but the themes of formed to be sent. And um, I find that for myself in, in complex times, when there are big decisions and there's heavy discernment and there's significant confusion, I need something to help bring clarity. Um, 
um, uh, and, and to remind me of what's at the center and what is most important. And, and these kind of clarifying experiences, they come in, in all different forms. And yesterday I had one, um, and it came in the form of crisis. Uh, yesterday morning, I was sitting here in the back during our first worship gathering, and um, I got a message that there's a, a young family who was going through a crisis. This young family had been a part of our church. Um, I did their wedding a few years ago. They've since moved away. They live in uh, Cuba, Kansas. But they're very connected to the church. Their extended family is a part of the, the Journey family, and they were in town visiting. And yesterday morning, their one-year-old little girl fell into a swimming pool and was found there uh, face down. And they, they pulled her from the water and uh, did CPR. And the paramedics came and transported her to the hospital in Hutchinson, and they were able to, to stabilize her, able to get her heart um, going. They were able to stabilize her enough to, to fly her to uh, Wichita, where she, she is at West, Wesley Medical Center in the pediatric intensive care unit. And, and she's stable, but she's still very critical. And so uh, I would invite you to pray. Um, pray for little Clara. Um, and just pray that God just begins, uh, continues to restore her, uh, just her body. Um, but yesterday, as I met with this family in the emergency department in the hospital in Hutchinson, um, and to see this beautiful little girl on a hospital bed, and to have all of these very skilled professionals around her caring for her and her being at the center of everyone's attention. If you've ever been in a moment like that, there's almost a hush reverence because everybody understands that this person, this child, has unmeasurable worth, ha has, has worth that could not be quantified, has unsurpassable worth. And we understand that that's true, not just of this little girl, but it's true of every human being on the planet. Um, that when a child is born and they, they're, they're put, you know, in their, their parents' arms, before they ever accomplish anything, before they add any tangible value, before they produce anything in this world, we know that this child has worth that could not be measured. And we know it. As followers of Jesus, we know this to be true. Um, and, and to paraphrase what Dallas Willard says, we understand that every person is a God-formed spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's good world. Can I say that again? Uh, it's, it's a bit of a heavy sentence, right? But every human being, you look around the room, you look at the person next to you and say, you are a God-formed spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's good world. This is, this is beautiful. This is who we are. We were someone made in the image of God, and, and not only that, made in the image of God, that God has formed us, but we are someone who, who Christ has given his life to redeem. And redemption is about value. Redemption is about ascribing worth to someone, about what you are willing to pay to buy back. And, and we're told, like, through the scriptures that Christ has redeemed us. He has redeemed us from sin and from death and from the, the evil one by giving his own life for us, for all humanity. And God's desire is for every human being to understand the worth that he has given them because they are formed in his image and what Christ has done for them to receive this promise and this gift of the fullness of life with him to be filled with a life that is full of Jesus, to flourish under God's leadership. And, and so yesterday was this kind of in the middle of heavy discernment and big conversations and all of those things, there was a clarifying moment for me to remind myself of why I'm here, that I'm here to help people come to know Jesus. Like I'm here to help people be formed and transformed in the love of Christ. It's, it's my why, it's my purpose. And, and I think it's our purpose together as a church. It's, it's what God has called us to do. And so Isaiah, this, this text that, that, Howard and Ka that Howard has read for us from Isaiah 6, has been our theme uh, throughout this 
the last few days, and, and it's a clarifying experience for the prophet Isaiah. Um, picture this, right? Isaiah, he, he's in the temple and he's worshiping, and all of a sudden, it's like the veil between heaven and earth disappears. Can you imagine this this morning? If like if all of a sudden the, the veil between heaven and earth was gone and Isaiah is in, invited in, ushered in to the very presence of God, to the, to the place where heaven and earth meet, that he is instantly aware that he is in the presence of the beginning and the end, the one who was and is and is to come, the one who is eternal. And it's, it, the text says that Isaiah saw the Lord. And in, in Isaiah's clarifying moment, he has a clear vision of God. He has a clear vision of God. And this is a wild experience, right? Six-winged heavenly creatures flying around and, and worshiping God and proclaiming God's goodness and God's purity. And, and they're saying the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. This is their message. The whole earth. If you have eyes to see it, the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. It reminds me of uh, one of my favorite poems by Elizabeth Barrett Browning where she says, uh, Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush is a fire with God but only he who sees takes off his shoes the rest sit round and pluck blackberries to which I say mm, blackberries that sounds kind of nice but I think it points to this, this reality that we have a choice, right? We have a choice on what we see, whether we see this clear vision of God, whether we look around and we have eyes to see God, his glory, his goodness, his purity, or whether we have this, um, this choice to just sit around and pluck blackberries. But Isaiah has this clear vision of God. And when we do that, it is absolutely transformative. And, and what happens to Isaiah is he then has an honest view of himself. He, um, he has this immediate reaction of becoming aware of his own brokenness. He, he has a clear vision of God and, and an honest view of himself. I mean, he says, it's over for me. I, I'm history. Every word I've ever spoken is a mess. It's all tainted. I have filthy lips and I live with people who have filthy lips. And here my eyes have seen the Lord, like when we get a vision of God, this blessed and only ruler, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, the first thing that happens is we end up seeing our own shadows. It's a deeply humbling experience. When we see ourselves against the light of God's goodness and purity, the natural reaction is just to pull away, to shrink back because we are immediately aware of all of our weaknesses, all of our sins, all of the ways we have been misformed in our souls. I mean, this is exactly what happens to Peter. Do you remember the calling of Peter when uh, Peter is fishing and he has this dude on the beach who's preaching and ends up commandeering Peter's boat and so Peter lets him and he's kind of you know gracious to him and Jesus is standing on Peter's boat and he's teaching and then all of a sudden after Jesus is done teaching he tells Peter go go put out in the deep water and Peter kind of resists like uh, we've been fishing all night we kind of know what we're doing here but since you say so and he throws his nets down and they have this this miraculous catch of fish and and in that moment this is peter's clarifying moment where he he sees a clear vision of god revealed in jesus and what what's peter's first response he says get away from me lord like i'm a sinful man he has this this honest view of himself and and peter he falls at jesus's feet and and this is his moment where he says i'm done plucking blackberries like i'm done that my life is going to be given to, to this to helping others see a clear vision of God. So there's a clear vision of God, there's an honest view of ourselves, and then there is a touch of God's grace. But this is what happens to Isaiah. One of the seraphim, these heavenly creatures, flew to me and with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and with it he touched my mouth. This, this place of Isaiah is like most, uh, the place that held the most of his shadows, his most kind of misformed place. He said, my lips are the sinful place. And, and this angelic creature touched his mouth and said, see, I've touched your lips and your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Now God, like right in his purity and in his goodness, what does he do? He doesn't turn away from us. 
but he comes to us and he purifies us and he reaches out his hand of grace and he makes us whole and holy. He atones for our sins. He forgives us. This is who God is, that God might dwell in unapproachable light, but in his light he approaches us. That his light, the light of his goodness and holiness and glory, it is not meant to harm us, it is meant to heal us. This is good news. This is who God is. Have you had an encounter like this, like Isaiah had? Have you ever had a moment like this? Where you just saw God in your own way? Maybe it was a little bit different than this. Uh, I, remember, I remember a moment um, when I was a, a junior in high school and I went with our youth um, ministry to Costa Rica, and it was, a, it was a new experience for me. I was out of my element. I didn't speak much Spanish. Earlier in the week, I told somebody I was Jesus Christ accidentally. Oh, I know. That's, should you laugh at that or not? I don't know. I wanted to. I, probably not. It was, a, it was a little Catholic woman, and I opened the door, and I wanted to say, Jesus Cristo te llama. Jesus Christ loves you. And I said, hola, me llamo Jesus Cristo. I am Jesus Christ. So there was that. Um, And I, um, but I had this experience in a worship gathering one night, and I had seen um, just God in some new ways during the day, and, and worship was just, it was just a special, you know those moments when the veil between heaven, it just kind of gets thin, and just felt the goodness and the presence of God. And, and it touched me in a way that I had not experienced up to that point before, and it broke me, but it didn't break me, it broke me open. It made me incredibly receptive to, to the voice of God, to the grace of God. I, I, felt, um, I felt a conviction because of some things that had um, sort of taken root in my heart. Um, I was a fairly angry young man. I had a lot of like, violence in my heart as a young man. And I just felt like kind of this, this conviction on that. And I had other people pray for me and felt this touch of God's grace through, through others. And after that experience, I remember like walking out in, into the night in uh, the mountains around San Jose, Costa Rica, and just saying, God, I will, I will give my life. I will give whatever you can use in me to help others come to know you and to experience you. Like when we have moments like this where we see God clearly, where we have an honest view of ourselves, this humility, when we experience the touch of God's grace, it changes us. And it puts us in this posture where we say, God, here, here I am. Whatever you can take, whatever you can use, I am yours. I wonder if, what that looks like for us. If we've had these moments, if, if maybe you haven't had moments like this, and you just there's a prayer today to ask, to say, God, would you help me see you clearly? Would you move? Would you move in my life? You see, this is, for Isaiah, and, and we have these moments of clarity like this, but, but I think there's also, it points, what happens in Isaiah's life is also a bit of a, a pattern for spiritual formation, the process of formation. Because we are, we are often not changed in an instant. I was not changed in that instant, and I don't think Isaiah was either. But there is a process of being formed, and, and Robert Mulholland has the best definition of spiritual formation I've ever heard, and it's, it's this. It's the, the process of being formed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. That's what God is doing in us. He's forming us into the image of Christ for the sake of others. Do you hear the formed to be sent in that? It's formation for mission, being formed for a purpose. Now, recently, I have, I have really gotten into wood turning videos on YouTube. I, I don't actually do it. Um, I'm not much of a craftsman uh, myself, but I have learned to appreciate it. And there's one, one particular craftsman, uh, Andy Phillip, that I've, I've really learned to love. And he's a master uh, wood turner. And I'll end up watching these videos. And as I'm, I'm watching a video, like all of a sudden my kids are around me because they're mesmer I mean, it's mesmerizing to watch this process, to watch the, like the wood chips go flying and, the, you know, the tool in their hand as the wood is spinning and, and to see uh, somebody who's a master craftsman take this, this hunk of wood that doesn't really have a very compelling form and turn it into something unique and really cool and beautiful. 
And, and we love it. We love this process of seeing something go from formless to, to a beautiful, purposeful form. I mean, I don't know what your thing is. Maybe it's not wood turning. Maybe you love to see an overgrown lawn get mowed. Or maybe you love to see personal transformation, right? You, you watch those like makeover shows or one of those like dozens of home makeover shows on HGTV. I don't know what your thing is, but I'm guessing you love transformation. And do you know why? Because this is how God made us. God has made us to grow, to change, that we are not static creatures, that we cannot stay the same, no matter how much we want to. On every level of our being, we are constantly changing and being formed all the way down to our cells and all the way up to our character. We are all in the process of becoming. And the only question is, what are we becoming? Who are we becoming? We are all being formed, and we are either being formed in the image of Christ or in some other image. This process that God is at work forming us by his love and his grace. And I want to just, I, I want to, us to hold this, this process that God took Isaiah through and to just look real briefly at Galatians 5, 16 to 26. Because what happened in a moment for Isaiah, Paul, he walks us through is happening in, in a lifetime. And just, just quickly here, Galatians chapter 5, Paul says this. He says, so I say, walk by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. There's a conflict with each other so that you do not do whatever you want. So Paul says there's an invitation to make choices that align with the Spirit of Christ. I mean, the Spirit is God's gift to us, the very presence of Jesus, the living Jesus that is with us, that is our guide, that is our companion, that is our leader. And this is a gift that God gives us when we trust our lives to Jesus, when we entrust him. And the role of the Spirit in our life is to point us to Jesus, to glorify Jesus, and to help us be formed in the way of Jesus. The role of the Spirit, we could say, is to give us a clear vision of God revealed in Jesus. And, and so Paul's invitation is to say, walk by the Spirit, learn to trust the Spirit, learn to listen to the Spirit, and have this clear vision of Jesus. And, and what happens is when we walk by the Spirit, oftentimes we have a humble view of ourselves because we realize there's a conflict within us. Anybody feel that this week? Like there, there's, a, there's a conflict inside of us between like the, the spirit, what Jesus is calling us to do, and that part of me that should not have control over me any longer, but I still feel it. Am I the only one? I mean, do you ever have reflections as you look back on your day and you're just like, oh my goodness, why did I lose my temper? You know, uh, I, should, I should have just been silent. I should have just kept my mouth shut. I should know better by now. Why did, I, why did I say that? I just kind of twisted the truth just enough to make me look better than I really am. I shouldn't have clicked on that website, right? Oh, I, I should have known better than that. Like we have, we have this conflict, this tension inside of us, and, and there's a struggle in, in formation. The formation is a messy process. In, earlier in Galatians 4, Paul talks about it as like childbirth. He's like, I'm in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. It is hard, it is painful, it is a struggle. Um, so I've been told, and and it's difficult. And, and this is the process. And the fact that there's a struggle is actually really good news because if there is no struggle inside of us, it means we have just given in to our sinful nature. But the, the spirit and our sinful nature, they, they, there is conflict, and we learn more and more to walk by the spirit. And we won't go into Paul. He, he goes um, in verses 19 to 21. He just says, you will notice, you will notice like the, the sinful nature. It comes out in these different areas of our life. And real briefly, he just says, you, you'll notice it in your sexuality. You'll notice it in your spirituality. You'll notice it in your relationships. There'll be broken relationships. And you'll notice it in just this loss of control. He gives this whole list. And then he gives a warning and he says this. He says, I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, what he's, what he's saying is that, like, when we, when we do these things, it will lead us to become a certain kind of person, and we end up cutting ourselves off from the life of God. And so, um, there is this, this warning in this, but then he says, but if we walk by the Spirit, there is this fruit that grows. And he says this, verse 22 to 25, but the fruit of the Spirit is this, is love 
and joy and peace and forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. For those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh, the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. That the Spirit brings this fruit. By God's grace, the touch of God's grace is that this fruit, this fruit of joy, peace, patience, it begins to grow in us over time in a process. We planted some fruit trees this last year. Um, we live on the north side of Hutch, and there are some really sandy soil. And so we planted these fruit trees in hopes that three to five years from now, we'll have some fruit. Fruit grows really slowly, right? I mean, this is a, this is a long process. Um, and, and I think this is the same thing with the fruit that is being formed in us. It looks like Jesus. It, it, it's a long process. And our effort doesn't go into growing the fruit, but our effort just goes into creating the kind of conditions where the fruit can grow. Our, our, our effort doesn't go into producing joy and peace and patience. Our effort goes into staying connected to Jesus, walking with the spirit of Jesus. And do you know what Jesus does? Is he, he has fruit grow inside of us. Are you with me on that? You see, um, I have a friend, a couple quick stories, I'll be done. I have a friend, I know that's surprising to a lot of people when I tell them that, but I do. Um, and he's, he's a big guy and intimidating stature. And he, um, for a long time, he was a very violent person. He used to drive around with a loaded weapon under his car, uh, under the, the seat in his car. And he was looking for an excuse to hurt somebody. And he, he learned to love Jesus and he learned to follow Jesus and to keep in step with the spirit and to just um, to not gratify the desires of his, you know, sort of sinful nature, but to, to keep in step with the spirit. And one day, years later, uh, one day he and his wife are at home and he, they hear a noise outside on the street. They live in town and he goes outside to, to check out what's going on and he sees somebody breaking into his car to either steal his car or steal something in his car. And he walks up to the guy and remember, he's a big dude and, and the guy who's breaking into his car is apparently a, a fairly small statured guy and so my friend just says hey what's going on like you need something and the guy looks up and sees this man towering over him and absolutely freaks out and rush screams and runs down the street into the darkness right there's an odd experience so my friend turns around kind of checks out the car nothing's too uh, badly damaged he turns around and he walks back toward the house and here's what he says he's like huh I think I'm a pacifist like, he, he just had this realization that there is no violence in my heart. There's no, there, this was like the moment I was waiting for to hurt somebody, and I couldn't. I just didn't have the anger, the violence in my heart. Why? Because Jesus had taken it away, that he had just been walking with Jesus, cultivating this life that looked like Jesus, and here was the fruit of Jesus. See, I find my favorite thing, this is where I'm going to end. This is um, my favorite thing. I often preach too long. I, it's, you can pray for me in that. Um, one of my favorite things to watch being turned on the lathe is a burl. Do, are you familiar with what a burl is? Um, it is a part of a tree that's kind of misformed. I think we have an image of this. Uh, it's misformed. It's like there was damage to the tree, and, um, and the tree just kind of grows trying to heal itself, and it's, it's really damaged, and uh, it doesn't look very good, right? It's, it's, it's misformation on the tree. And wood turners and woodworkers love this stuff because it creates really interesting patterns in the wood. And so to watch uh, my favorite wood turner, Andy Phillip, he does this where he turns this burl into a beautiful bowl. I mean, he takes this thing that's kind of unsightly, it's, it's, it's a misformation, and he turns it into something beautiful. And I find that this is, what, this is what God does in us. This is what it means to be sent, I think. A scent is not just an activity we do. It's not like I'm going to go be sent this afternoon. I'm going to do this thing. But it's learning to allow Jesus to turn us into a beautiful soul, a Jesus-formed soul, and then to let others see into our soul, to live in such a way that people can see the grace of God, this master craftsman who has been shaping us and forming us. And, and this, is, this is what God is doing in us. Let's just, just give our, ourselves a moment to listen to what God might want to speak to us personally today. God, more than anything else, 
We want to see you clearly. God, we ask that even, even in this moment that you would help us to have a clear vision of you, that your spirit would be at work in us, that God, if your spirit nudges a, a part of our life that is, is being misformed, that you would, by your grace, just touch us in that place and heal us, transform us, God, we ask. God, we ask that we would be humble enough to receive your Spirit's work in us. God, we ask that you would form us into to beautiful souls, to those who look like Jesus, who have the fruit of your Spirit, God, within us. And God, that we can share the beauty of who you are making us to be with the world around us, with those precious people who we will encounter today and tomorrow and every day of our lives who have unsurpassable worth because they are God-formed spiritual beings with an eternal destiny in your good world. Do your work, we pray.